That is the end of our presentations. We're going to transition to the uh, panel discussion now. And uh, what uh, I think I have to introduce my department head. He's, uh, you already know who Bruce Lee Hall is. And he's going to give an overview on, on our goal for the uh, panel discussion. Mississippi State, with the economist, Republican economist. 
being in the hardwood, John Hodges, and then the Norman Vegas, uh, and it's a tower. Remember, gentlemen, you've only got two minutes. Now, we're going to have roaming microphones, and microphones will be passed down to the panelists. They'll have two minutes. And then we'll need a volunteer somewhere in that area to hold the microphone, and then some volunteer in that area to hold the microphone to give a comment. Either the microphone will be passed down to you. Stand up, state your name, and then ask your comment and so forth. The point is, I cannot overemphasize this. This is the point to raise your issues, raise your questions. You have a lot of information you've done over the past day and a half. Now it's time for you to ask the key questions on, as I wrote them down, what has been said, if you're concerned, or you have doubts, or you're confused about some of the information, and clarify it, raise it on this issue. Possible solutions, if there's some, you know, we, we've seen people, individuals have indicated information gaps, knowledge gaps, if you have uh, suggestions for that, and any needs. Particularly, I know there's several individuals in the room that are discussing what possible research needs we need to have with regard to the issues that we would, this mini symposium is dealing with. Now for our moderator, it's Dr. Jimmy Avery. He's extension professor in the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Aquaculture and at the uh, Thad Copper Warm Water Aquaculture Center. He's also the extension coordinator in aquaculture. He's also the director of the Southern Regional Aquaculture Center. Now Dr. Avery, if you've heard the common words, aquaculture, He's in the catfish. He's got no dog in this hunt. That's why we picked it. Okay, he's catfish. It was no idea about basil area or DBH or you know shelter wood. No idea. That's why we wanted someone to be completely impartial. So Dr. Avery is uh, has graciously agreed to be our moderator. <clears throat> I've also told you that the white paper, and then lastly, uh, for those of you who have presentations, we would like your permission to download the, your presentations with Tate. We would like to have a presentation to put on that DVD as well, particularly for our two uh, white paper analysts. So, but we need to have your permission, so if you let Laura know on the way out. Now, we're going to have a panel discussion. Now we're going to have lunch. They're going to bring you back. I think this is an excellent uh, format because we'll lay some groundwork, get some key questions out. Uh, can you during lunch, you can talk among yourselves and get fired up and come back in for some really more discussion. All right, so I like the idea of just getting an, an initial panel going. We feed you, you're happy again, and then you have an opportunity during lunch to really get things, uh, some ideas churning. So that's the uh, format for our uh, panel discussion. Are there any general, any general questions? Right, the one thing about the mini symposium is, yeah, if you've noticed, it's been kind of cheap. No banquet, no fancy snacks, but our point of mini symposium is to get you people here. If we start charging $200, $300, like other symposia, that has a, an economic restriction that we didn't want to have. We wanted all of you here with the opportunity, so feed your lunch, some snacks, and hopefully you've appreciated that. We thought we had 75 participants. We had 100, almost 140. We just get to go on the ball. Be quiet. Yeah. This is the man who we're about to get some pots. We get some raises in Mississippi State. I just got out where I'm going to go back. 138 individuals have attended. Now, one confusing point was some of you registered for the symposium, some of you registered for the panel discussion. Don't worry, some of you asked, may I come to the panel discussion? I didn't register. It seems a very important point when I wrap up. But you can come. All we needed to know was whether we needed a table of 20 people or a room for 120. And obviously, we needed a room for 120. So, Dr. Avery, I'll turn it over to you before Dr. DeMaris has a heart attack.
somebody turn down that over? I don't think so. Um, a call came to my area and the room is locked. I don't have access to the microphone. Well, first I want to say it is an honor to participate with this group today. Uh, certainly, and I have purposely not attended, so I would not develop that bias uh, early on. Um, but it is uh, uh, certainly an issue that I think uh, uh, warrants this kind of open discussion. Uh, Bruce said uh, that I had no experience, and, and I, I really have done in this subject, but I did have 28 years of extension experience, and a certain part of that was as alligator and crawfish specialist in Louisiana. So I, I know hostile crowds when I, when I see them at times. So hopefully, I mean, I, I realize we're all professionals in this group and, and we'll handle that uh, in a professional manner as we go through these discussions. One thing I would like to add to Bruce's uh, instructions is that as we get comments uh, from the audience, at least the first time that you speak, give your name and your agency, okay? As you follow up with that, there's no need to get the agency affiliation again. We'll be able to track that as we go back through the records to kind of, so we, if they need to come back and separate comments out by agency or something, it'll make it a lot easier than going back to the registration uh, from the beginning. So with that, we'll get started. As uh, Bruce said, we have uh, our panelists, kind of a two minute uh, time window here. I will uh, keep the hook close. Uh, for that. So we'll, we'll just start those closest to me. Uh, and, and I'll give you the option. If you'd like to come up to the podium, uh, that's fine. I think everybody can see just whatever you feel more comfortable with. All right. Can you hear me fine? No. Okay. All right. For those that don't know, uh, I'm Randy Wilson, as Bruce said, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. But uh, more importantly, today I'm here as the chair of the Lower Miss Joint Venture Forest Resource Conservation Working Group. So I'm kind of representing our, our broad partnership. And so during the question and answer, I may defer back to Kenny or Buddy or somebody in the audience to um, better suited to answer those questions. And so brief synopsis, uh, kind of while we're here at the whole symposium over the last couple of years, um, there's been discussions related to the implementation of desired forest conditions. What are they, what do they mean, what are we doing on the ground? Um, through that, I think I have a good grasp of what the primary issues and concerns are, um, but even still I have some fundamental lack of knowledge and I think there's some misconceptions and misunderstandings still in the audience and in the larger conservation community that we need to kind of clarify and clean up. The only way to do that would be to clearly articulate those concerns and issues over the next couple hours and discuss those and once we have those on paper, then we can figure out how to address them. So that's kind of my role and my purpose here. My name is Norman Davis with Anderson Tully Company. We're a large landowner in the Mississippi Alluvial Valley. We've got 15 forestry personnel and two wildlife personnel that manage our property. And in the management of our property, we obviously have a lot of neighbors. Uh, these neighbors uh, occasionally ask us to contractually manage their property. And in one of those uh, relationships with a large landowner, they were uh, of the opinion that DFC management needed to drive their, uh, their management. So they asked us as their consulting uh, agents to write a management plan so uh, it, it was a steep learning curve for me as well as some of our foresters our bio our biologists had been associated with the dfc committees uh, and establishment of those criteria so it's my part here as as we jump from public lands to private lands and these were private recreational users what are some of the issues we're facing there? So not, not long-term dealings with DFCs as Buddy and his group have, but obviously have, have a little bit of insight there. My name is Ian Mung. I'm a uh, resource economist at Mississippi State. 
Uh, by way of background, I am a forester. I managed 80,000 acres of timber land in North Louisiana and South Arkansas for over a decade. Uh, subsequently came back to school and finished up and now teach at Mississippi State. Uh, there, my research, uh, and a large component of my research is on the economic aspects of wildlife recreation. And uh, just anecdotally, I work with a consortium of about 80 different landowners in the Starkville area and have their perspective uh, on management of their, of their properties and in part management of their harvest lands. Uh, they allow us to bring our students to their property and develop management plans for them. So annually, I get some feedback from that subsample of landowners on what they want done or what they're looking for in their harbor management. I'm John Hodges and I'm retired. I'm not obligated to anyone. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think that my concern with, the, with, with uh, this whole thing is that we need to be uh, in, do, in presenting the DSCs to private landowners, they need to be uh, a lot more clear as to what they were intended for. And I think it was primarily for birds, and that needs to be clear to the landowner, much more than it is now. And they need to uh, state if they are, uh, if the landowner main objective is timber production, they need to really emphasize how they need to go about to making sure that's maintained in using the DFCs. I got no problem with DFCs, but I think the landowner needs to be made fully aware of how uh, of what it does and how they have to modify if they're primarily interested in or largely interested in timber production. Uh, don't make any statements in there without scientific background. That's the main thing. I think there's some statements made that are scientifically backed up. And we need to clean up our terminology in it too. Those are really my main concerns. Okay, with that, we'll turn it over to questions from the audience. Uh, what I'd like to do there is that, uh, raise your hand, I'll recognize you. You need, first, I would like ask that you state whether you're gonna make, whether you are making a, a comment, you have a question for the group, or you have a question for a specific panelist, okay? Is that understood? And we'll proceed that way. At least that way it'll be recorded well and be able to transcribe as well. Uh, and probably one of the few people I know the name in this room, Steve. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, I don't think this is on. <laughs> <laughs> I knew the switch was somewhere. My name is uh, Steve Grado, Department of Forestry. This is going to be a question. Uh, too close to that? Thanks. Um, I'm sort of a, a newcomer to the um, conversation. I guess I gotta move over here. Should I go out the door? <laughs> no. Uh, I know that a lot of these desired forest conditions, a lot of the studies and, and data have emanated off public lands. And, you know, we're talking about migratory birds to some extent. And I was wondering if those people that are, you know, presenting desired forest conditions have actually looked at data on private enterprise and what they're doing relative to managing the forest and how that's impacting the wildlife species because in some case you can make the argument that there are other things going on that could be impacting those birds more than the way somebody is managing a forest like deforestation, commercial development, etc. So that's the question, have you looked at data outside of an experimental setting on pu public lands and compared it to what the private sector is doing. Is that a legitimate question? Where's my microphone? So if the question is the comparison of management on public lands versus private industrial land, or is it how do birds respond in a larger scale? Well, yeah, have you looked at, you're, you're look, presenting your management and how the birds have responded to various experimental things, but have you looked into the private sector and see exactly what it is they're doing uh, and, and seen 
what the impact to wildlife is there. Is it significantly different than what you're pro pro you know, proposing? We have done some research on private industry and private landowners, but I guess the point I want to make is, back to, to go back to Kennedy's talk, DFCs are nothing more than structural attributes that define what we're looking for. After that, there's no silver bullet prescription. So the treatments that we're applying, just like Buddy described, the whole litany, are the same treatments and types of prescriptions that are being used on private lands as well. And so there, it's kind of, that's part of the misconception, I think, is that we're doing something totally different than the rest of the world, which is false. That's inaccurate. Now, at looking for bird responses, I mean, yeah, we have that in relation to fragmentation at the landscape scale from urban sprawl and all of those sorts of things. And there is impacts going on at the landscape scale, and it's very confounded. Um, a lot of the nest success issues are being looked at at that level. Uh, it gets down to productivity, and we're looking at population sustainability. So you're correct, there's more things going on than just at that one spatial scale. We're looking to see how our treatments are helping or hurting those birds and other wildlife at that stand scale. But then other folks, Dan and other colleagues, are looking at it at different spatial scales. And not all of those colleagues are here today to provide the details in, inside into that. But the bottom line is, that's part of the misconception is that we're doing something different than the rest of the world in terms of our management strategies. And that's not the case. Yes, yeah, right. Let's address the, what you just brought up, Randy, about we're not doing anything different from anyone else. But as I sat here yesterday listening to presentations and this morning, what I heard Buddy discuss and what they're doing in Louisiana is very different from what I've seen going on on the refuge system in Mississippi and Arkansas. It's very different than what you described shaking your head but that's the way I perceive it so uh, by your own admittance yesterday Jeff you described uh, what you're doing on White River as intermediate stand practices and what I'm seeing Buddy's group do they're doing intermediate stand practices and they're doing other they have a management system so the way I see DFC described for other areas, it's not a management system. It's a it's a it's a guild of intermediate stand practices that basically have no uh, provisions for sustainability of certain resources past that intermediate level. So maybe you can address it. I will attempt to address it, and I'm going to throw it back to Jeff. <laughs> single them out there in that again it goes back to the, the concept and definition of DFC. DFC is not a forest management plan. DFCs are the structural attributes we're looking for. If Buddy has a better forest management strategy and plan than Jeff, then that's between them. That's what that local manager and I can't answer that because I don't manage the forest on any of those. And so that's where I want to throw it back to Buddy or Jeff to comment in terms of how they're applying their silvicultural treatments in attainment of trying to attain the DFC conditions. That's part of the big misconception is the DFCs is just that qualifies out blueprint. Here's what we're looking for structurally. Now it's up to Buddy and Jeff and whoever in the on the ground forester to figure out how to move it there. So if there's a problem with their strategies, how they're viewing it, then that's an issue with that local forester that we need to deal with. It's not an issue of DFCs, per se. Jeff, you want to? <laughs> I'm uh, Jeff Dittman with the Fish and Wildlife Service. And a question for a question. You 
said certain resources. Which resources are we not addressing? <laughs> Specifically, red oak reproduction. If that's an issue, it, it may or may not be a management objective. Let me let me give you a little background first on our role as a forest service. Our role as a forest service scientist. We're bound by a uh, 60 some odd page document that's handed out by USDA, it's an ethics code. So we don't, we cannot endorse any particular practice. We conduct research. We conduct research. We're supposed to give our findings out to all landowners. I don't care if you manage one way or the other. I really don't. Based on our research, based on our study of seedling physiology, based on our studies of stand development, based on our studies of the physics of the lot environment, based on long-term studies of stand development, what our research tells us is that um, uneven age management practices, the largest of which would be group selections, uh, would not facilitate development of red oak in overstores. That's our research. Whether you take that information or use it or not, it really isn't an issue for us. We're providing that information for any user. Thank you, Doug. I expected you were going to talk about red oak, but I didn't want to put words in your mouth. And uh, yes, the refuge system does manage for it. It's very important for waterfowl and all other wildlife. What we find is that uh, in our stands, it's very common to have red oaks of all diameter classes. Seedlings, saplings, six inches, 12 inches, 18 inches, 24 inches, up to 40 inches. And so as we do our intermediate treatments, we are thinning amongst those trees along with the other species that occur. And we are releasing the regeneration that's already established by group cuts, if you consider. And of course, there's a lot of discrepancy. What's, I'm not clear what, how many trees do you have to cut to make a group? The two adjacent trees, a half acre, but we pour the sunshine to the oak regeneration where it occurs. We do not see the need to cut down 12 inch and 18 inch red oaks to grow them back in an even age condition. They are growing in small even age patches and we find we can release those and encourage those. I have some photos so that we have a, a, a uh, a canopy that has gaps, but we have trees of various sizes, uh, various ages, intermingled in the stand. As I noted from our review from 1990, that it appears to be a 3 h stand over most of the forest. A large amount of regeneration, various sizes of seedlings to small poles. The red oak regeneration is abundant on both of the red oak sites. And these are from this review from some of the same people in this room. And so I did specifically address it yesterday, but yes, we think we're regenerating red oak with an uneven age regeneration method. And I do well understand the Stonewall experience is not borne that out. But I don't know of Stonewall researching anything in the White River Basin in the last 40 years. And I well understand the difficulties of travel. You have to drive by a lot of good woods to look at and come over there to research. But we've not had the research in the White River Bottoms, um, or the Cash River, or these uh, bios that I've worked in. There's been some work in the Washtenaw and Salina River. You know, they look like they're pretty heavy oak stands. As I said, it will not work everywhere. It doesn't work in some places. 
but DNH regeneration is not sufficiently promoted red oak in many places as well. So no su successful or unsuccessful attempts anywhere in any particular place. But it's hard to say it does not work anywhere until you have looked everywhere in the world. I haven't been there for nearly 30 years. I know there's not been anybody research red oak regeneration on White River Refuge. As an agency, we are not in the research field. We're in the management field. But I can present our findings, our data, and I think we can say uneven age regeneration of red oak is working in some places. And it's a fallacy to say it will work nowhere if you have looked everywhere. Yeah. Questions back, back in the back. Let me comment on that. <laughs> okay, and then we'll reserve the other question. Number one, I'm familiar with that, with the White River, and I've and worked in that area quite a bit. And, and number one, do you know where the regeneration came from? If I recall the White River back in the late 70s, early 80s, there was some very heavy cutting in that area, and it, it, it amounted to a sheltered wood cut. And a lot of the regeneration that you have now probably may have come from that shelter we cut. Have you actually documented where the regeneration came from? In other words, did you do a, an inventory of the area before cutting and an inventory of the area after cutting so that you can actually document regeneration occurring after the cuts? Re, uh, and I agree with you, White River is a unique area because of the fact that you don't have much of an understory competition because of the flooding that occurs there. So it, it, it's very likely that you might be able to get it in smaller openings simply because you don't have that kind of understory competition. So, but you need to be, it needs to be documented. That's the thing. Where did the originate, where did the regeneration originate, really? I would, uh, I would certainly say the red oak in the 16 inch to 20 inch class was released from the heavy cuts. Uh, there was a very heavy thinning in the 50s through the 60s and the very early 70s. And that likely released a lot of uh, red oak regeneration that may have been established from the heavy cuts from the 1930s of the timber reservation after acquisition. So prior to World War II, there was cutting. It's logical to think that some of those oaks got established in the 40s from the diamond of cutting they were doing, timber reservation. It got released in the caves in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s, and now it's in the 18 inch, 24 inch diamond classes, growing like a weed, number one ball. But yet I have a picture of Terry Mark Oak that's taller than me was not there when I cut it 22 years ago and it's there now there 15 years there 22 and we're releasing it now so we think we have regeneration of a number of age classes uh, from these periodic cuts observation of the timber company land we acquired we acquired 40,000 acres from potlatch in the 90s I was a, I'm a former employee of potlatch their practice were to cut the logs about every eight years. Not real heavy cuts, but real frequent cuts. Those areas of <coughs> disturbances continue to have oak regeneration from knee high, shoulder high, and up into the pole classes. Those repeated disturbances seem to feed enough sunlight that those red oaks are thriving on those sites wherever they're suitable. And uh, it's an uneven age standing condition. Did I answer some of that? Yeah, not really. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, 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 let's take you. back to this question in the back. I'm Dan Day with the uh, U.S. Forest Service Northern Research Station in Missouri. And I've been studying oak systems for decades now. And I've never been to the White River, so it could be God's country in a very unique place in the east here. But I am familiar with a lot of 
over generation failures in the uplands and in the bottomlands by just about any kind of cutting method. And a lot of you probably know some of the factors behind that. And one thing, Jeff, that I saw, and I've never been there, so I'm just really curious. I'm not jumping all over you or anything, but the, the, the diameter distribution slide you did present in your talk, it made, it made me question if what you were doing was sustainable for this reason. And I, it kind of builds on what John was saying, that a lot of times the larger part of the diameter distribution is the result of things that happened 20 and 30 and 40 years ago. And what I, what I saw in, your, in, the, in the smaller end size classes of your diameter distribution was lots of seedlings, and then it went down to nearly zero. And then there was this wave rolling out into the larger uh, size classes. And so it just made me wonder, you know, if that lack of smaller saplings, larger saplings, the one you were standing next to in the whole after 22 years of release, which was just six or eight foot tall or whatever, if that was really, if your management was promoting recruitment into the overstory. So it's just, you know, it just made me wonder. I wasn't, it was, I wasn't convinced. In fact, it was kind of a red flag to me that something might not be, there may be a disconnect there in the recruitment process into the overstory. I'm Dan Tweet, U.S. Geological Survey, protects the Wildlife Research Center. And as, like Emil, I'm uh, also a researcher. I don't have, I don't manage any land. I just kind of look at what's out there and how the responses are taking place. But I would like to address a couple of points, one being the sustainability of the system. For wildlife, what we're looking at is a forest structure that we're trying to maintain a sustainable forest structure. And I hear a lot of talk about red oaks, and I fully understand the economics that are driving the system. Don't get me wrong. But the question is, are we letting the economics drive our wildlife issues, or should we be letting the forest structure tell us where we want to go? What the birds, or at least the wildlife issues that I'm dealing with are, we recognize they need a certain forest structure. By and large, most of the critters out there are not really concerned about which forest species are taking place. And in fact, as Buddy pointed out, in many cases, we want to get better and more diverse forest structure out there, more species for a variety of reasons. Not only do they produce different seeds whether they're acorns or other type of soft mass at different times of the year for different species. Also, each of those individuals maintains a host of insects, insect predators that these uh, other fauna are preying upon. And when we put all our focus on an unsustainable system in which we're basically whacking that back to ground zero, regrowing it, cutting it back, regrowing it, that is not, in my mind, a sustainable system. That is an unsustainable system. You're just, you're perpetuating a early successional community rather than trying to maintain a forest structure over time. And that's probably not a good economically viable picture for most of you, but that is in fact, from a wildlife perspective, we're looking at forest structure and not the species composition. James Henderson, Mississippi State University Extension Service. The question about economics. The reason that's relevant here is some of the early introductions of DSC for public consumption, for, for private landowners to adopt. Claims were made that this is excellent for game species and you will sacrifice little, if any, timber income over time. So it became necessary to explain that these two systems are different. There are trade-offs. That's why Dr. Grado gave a presentation talking about the opportunity cost of managing for wildlife or timber. 
not trying to say that one is bad, that wild, men's wildlife is bad. We just want the public to know if they're trying to make a decision, will I apply this management or not? We have to be very careful and accurate in describing the opportunity costs, the trade-offs. If they want wildlife, they pursue that. But we can't tell them that they'll have wildlife and timber and turkeys dancing in the streets. Go back to our panelists here for a second. First of all, again, that's another misunderstanding and misinterpretation of what was said in the early stages. We told the landowners straight up what their pros and cons were, the gives and takes. And there are several people here in this room that can address that uh, very issue. And then related to that, this is what, I have to be real careful here, it's one of my hot topics. There's been repeated attempts to use that line of thinking to discredit the DFC in terms of economics. Your presentation yesterday was riddled, again, with inaccuracies, faulty assumptions, and so forth. We can have a whole conversation on that. I don't want to derail the whole symposium, but that's the kind of stuff, there's misconceptions and misunderstandings that we need to clarify. And as long as people keep perpetuating this notion that we're selling a sad song to the landowner, it's wrong. I mean, do you want to know what was, I mean, we'll ask, you know, ask us. We told them straight up, you want wildlife? What's your objective? They said, we want wildlife, but we want some timber. Like, okay, we can deal with that. And then we told them what the trade-offs were. You gonna give up a little bit in the timber? Probably, because we're gonna leave some trees that Steve Meadows put on the truck and take down the road. That's initially, past that, just like Dr. Hodges said yesterday, it bases up based on what comes in next. What's the next stand? How does it develop? What's the markets? What's the trade-offs? Hydrology regimes. That's hard to model. We cannot model that. It's hard. And so we can't give him a true answer. Norman and I sat in a meeting last week with the landowner asked us the same question. Did we answer his question, Norman? No, that's the answer. I mean, he wants an answer. Right. <laughs> so, uh, and if I can defer to the gentleman in the red shirt. Why don't you let me pick those? We'll go back to one of the organizers, Andy, first, and then we'll go to the person you registered. My name is Andy Ezell. I'm from Mississippi State University. First, a point of clarification, I was out of the room uh, taking a call from the office with my father being out. My understanding is that there was a discussion that I had uh, presented that perhaps we should carry stands of 50 square feet for basal area that's managing the stand. My presentation was totally about regenerating desirable species of hardwoods. That was the title of the presentation, look at your program, and that was all about regenerating. It was not about managing the stem in perpetuity at 50 square feet of basal area. So let's just get that clear on the front end. I have a couple of other things, but I would make a comment here that if you don't want to, getting back to Mr. Wilson's comment, if you don't want to derail the conversation, my advice would be not to make inflammatory comments. In the uh, red, red shirt. If I might address your... If you'll wait till the uh, microphone. Sure. So. I'm all? Yes. Sir. If I might directly address you, the... Name, uh, please. I'm sorry. Name and agency affiliation, please. I am Jim Johnson. I'm currently a contractor working with the Mississippi Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. Okay? Thank you. If I might directly address uh, the comments relative to the <coughs> message presented to private landowners that you were referring to, and I've had that, I have heard that singular statement from multiple participants at this symposium. As a participant, and probably 90% perhaps even more than that, of those presentations, those field trips, uh, made available to private landowners, scattered up and down the MAB. I participated in or led 
uh, participated in all of them, lived multiple ones of them. And I cannot recall any instance or any circumstance where those audience participants was not informed entirely and totally that yes, indeed, if they choose as a landowner to adopt their management approach that establishes wildlife outputs as their priority objective, that's what their property is, then it's going to cost them. How much it's going to cost them is a question that I can't answer. I don't think you can answer it. I don't think any of us can answer it. There is a obvious gap in data, scientific data, that we can articulate. We can measure some of those basic things of maximizing perhaps wood production, minimizing it perhaps. But there are some gaps there. Nevertheless, there is a cost associated with it. That cost is going to be highly variable from one site to the next. It's going to be variable from conditions of an existing stand that they're attempting to treat. So I, I got a little bit perturbed, and, and Dr. Zell, I, I respect your comments about inflammatory comments, and I, and I certainly don't want to go there. Uh, but I got a little concerned to hear my peers in the profession um, making that accusation consistently. That the message was presented, you can have it all. Yes, it will cost. And that was made very, very clear. And I say that as a participant and a leader, the vast majority of those presentations to these landowners. So with that, I was, I will stop addressing that specific point. There are other questions that I have and I'll defer to later on or um, other parts of this conversation. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, my name is Dan Prebus from Delta Wildlife. I just like to just to kind of address a little bit where that may be coming from. This is in the uh, the document we produced back in 2011. I'm just going to read the statement. Put the mic on, Dan. I don't think it's on. If it's on, just so you can talk a little bit. Okay. Uh, this states the question is under frequently asked questions: Is DFCs is managing for DFCs economically feasible and proven? And the part of the response, the well, initial response is yes. And then it goes on to say harvesters' revenues from individual timber cuts may be less but should be offset by the standard return from more frequent harvest. It is the opinion of many members of the committee that the benefits to wildlife will outweigh the potential loss of income. So I think yeah. that's where, I think that's where that is, that is coming from. Uh, Jenny Jones, probably the only other person. Yeah, I at the risk of making everyone angry. Uh, and uh, yeah, Jeannie Jones, uh, I'm a, actually a private lands forest owner. I do have a lands in forest and minor stream bottoms. Uh, you may know me as the, the vertically challenged woman who teaches as a professor at Mississippi State. Uh, I really know that this is a, a hot and contentious issue. Uh, some of us are talking about one type of wildlife assemblage, early successional gap species. People like me are looking at uh, conservation of woodland salamanders and rapid nest figured bats who need older closed canopy forests. My little brother who has sprouted pin feathers under his arm because he's an avid turkey hunter, likes the closed <coughs> canopy forests for hunting and recreation. So I, I preface that to say that I have multiple interests in this. And so that we don't get in a really um, big, um, maybe an ego battle and a territorial battle. I think we still need to come back to what is the objective of the landowner and not um, maybe not respect that landowner's ability to make uh, decisions about economic return on the land. Whether it's for wildlife that need mature climax forests or it's gap successional species or as timber commodities, be a red oak or hickory for baseball bats. So there's a lot of variability out there in the system. And I view what we're speaking of today is just different approaches to help landowners maybe diversify income 
diversified forest structure and wildlife communities. So I say that to say there's a lot of different interests here. Me being one forest landowner who I will just let my forest mature and the cold trees will be able to stand for up and as big or bats. I was the one that groaned in the back yesterday, you know. You didn't like my slide. I loved your slide, but I would have flagged it to keep it. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> Okay, on, on this side of the road, Jimmy, just a second to, for the okay. for the record, uh, Dan was quoting from uh, uh, off of the uh, Lower Mississippi Valley Joint Venture Forest Resource Conservation Working Group web page. What do you, what do you say? Thank you, Steve. I was going to ask that as well. You think on this side of the road? Anybody that has not posed a question yet? Yeah. I'm Joe Friend with Arkansas Forestry Commission. We work primarily with private landowners that own small tracts of land in the lower Mississippi Valley, uh, primarily in Chico, Deshaies, and uh, Jefferson counties, and Lincoln, somewhat Lincoln County. My question is this, do I go back and tell these landowners, you need to manage your timber this way, and I go back and tell these landowners, you need to manage it this way, or do I tell these landowners, we will help you manage it the best way that you want it managed? My name is Steve Brock. I'm a partnership coordinator with the Northwest Valley Joint Venture Partnership. And uh, I have a, a kind of a broad question listening to the exchanges and debates that are going on. And it, and it really drives around Bill's kind of bit about the, to, in a general sense, the fact that group selection has been shown not to be an effective means of regenerating folks. It, it just appears to me, and where I'm struggling watching all the presentations, is that, uh, and using buddies this morning is a, is a great example, the implementation of DFCs by the foresters, Jeff, that have made presentations, they demonstrate the fact that in the, their approaches to treatments, they're considering either the presence of advanced regeneration before they apply various treatments within a stand, or the need to develop that advanced regeneration, and it's specifically including oak in the way they treat those stands. And the issue is not whether you use group selection or the way you treat, it's whether you're considering those in those treatments and applying treatments that then advance that regeneration into the stand through time. And as I look at the images that Dr. Ezell and others have presented and then the same ones that Jeff and Buddy have demonstrated and the way they're applying treatments to those stands, I do not see dramatic differences in those treatments and the way they're being applied to, the, to, to advance that regeneration. Now is the the management of a specific forest or stand uh, in terms of the complexity of re-entering and more frequent entries and treating those areas to release that regeneration more complex and thus more expensive? Yes, it is. But, but the divide between the ability to create that regeneration and the interest of the DFC approach to doing that appears to be there to me, but we seem to be very stuck on the point of whether or not that's going to happen. And, and I don't see in the presentations or in the implementation of, of what's been presented by the DOC side of the camp is not seriously considering that concern and applying practices that will allow it to happen within the stand. And I don't know who might want to respond to that. I'll respond to it. There's no difference if DFC explains to the landowner just how he must go about doing it. But you can't tell the landowner that I'm going to cut a certain amount and have a certain amount of regeneration without saying how do I get that regeneration because just cutting won't bring it about. You've got to know how to get it and, and it's by doing the group selection, if the regeneration is not already there, there it's going to be much harder to get. But that, all of that needs to be explained to the landowner that it'll work if you take these precautions. But they need to understand that it's more difficult to do that 
using any uneven age system than it is an even age system. It can work, but they better use the right precautions. Staying that over close to your mouth. Okay. Email guardian. What? The issue that I see is not regeneration. It's really not. We can get oak regeneration. We can get red oak regeneration in just about any kind of staying condition we create. The issue is developing that up in the future camp. And I, and I made that up. And that this goes back, Dan, I'd like to bring the discussion back here about sustainability. What I learned just now is you have a very different vision of what sustainability of a forest is than I do as a forest. Your, your description of whacking it off over time, from a forester's perspective, uh, if you're not degrading that stand, if you're providing for future uh, management options that aren't, at a, at a level decrease from where you started, it's sustainability. From a forester's perspective, when we go into these stands and have reproduction and make these smaller openings that don't allow the reproduction to develop, but we keep picking away at those stands, that we see as unsustainable. Because what we're gonna do is develop that more shade tolerant canopy. And over time, we feel as Brian pointed out in his last slide, that you're actually degrading that stand for values like vertical structure because the shade tolerance species don't have the same potential for height growth. So, so I think you've identified one of the real differences here is how we perceive sustainability and how we advance from that. Norman Davis with Anderson Tully Company. I referred to the client uh, we were trying to work into DFCs, and I was in uh, on tours, and I never did hear anybody promoting the fact that uh, that managing timber by DFCs would would not uh, cause some sort of negative consequence, you know, financially. So I did want to say that. But I do think, you know, hunters are always looking for the next, you know, that great lure, that, that, boy, if I just had a high fence, if I just had this, if I just had that. And the idea, well, it was said that, that we, we have data that managing by DFCs uh, it is positive on these endangered species. Uh, and the jump has been made to game species. And these hunters are out there saying, I'm in, you know, I'm in. If, you know, if I can uh, kill that 160 class buck for every thousand acres we have, and I'm not saying people are, are guaranteed, they're not. But, uh, you know, when they, when they look across the line and there's Anderson Tully land, and as Dr. Hodges pointed out way too many times yesterday, that we may, <laughs> really, we're the poster child for making uh, single tree selection. Uh, you know, if you ever thought that it might be a regeneration tool, it's not. We can prove that. So once our permanent plot data showed that and showed that consistently, and we got markets for all of that mid-story junk, uh, I mean, you know, we knew it was a, a problem in our in our heads. We didn't have the we didn't have the data till till along into the early 80s. But we didn't have the market. I mean, we could have spent a lot of money, and we were spending money to inject back in the 80s. So it's not like we were doing anything. I weren't doing anything. But when we started being able to make money on that, is when the civil culture changed drastically on our land. And all these folks say is, you know, we just don't want our land to look like that. And well, that has probably some of the uh, highest potential 
for uh, desirable species, shade and tolerant species, of any place, you know, on the Mississippi River. And, and frankly, the property that we're managing uh, has been somewhat high graded over the years, and it's two thirds of the volume is in the lowest value species uh, that, that are on the Mississippi River. Two thirds of the volume. We got to do something. So our, our intent is let's get going, let's get going. So it was, I mean, we voiced our concerns uh, from, from just our experience and knowledge base. We expressed our concerns uh, to the landowner about going this route, and they said, that's the route we want to go until we see, now, you know, they're business people. Uh, if it's a 5% loss, opportunity cost, yeah, I might could take that. If it's a 25% opportunity cost, I don't know that we'd do that, you know. So they're looking for answers. So hopefully out of all this, will come, uh, you know, more focused research in the area. Because I personally, I've been uh, in and around bottomland hardwood on the Mississippi River for 35 years. And just what I know, from Cairo, Illinois to Baton Rouge, I've seen over 250,000 acres of land between the lip that has gone from private industrial to private recreation. And these folks have a different mindset. You know, they, they love the money. That defrays camp costs and all that. But they paid $300,000 for their membership because they like to hunt. And they want to see that investment grow. And if there's a perception that because they're managing by DFCs that this will lead to uh, better game harvest, turkey, deer, whatever, they're all in, so uh, that's kind of my story. I've got two here. First here, and then I've got, I'm not going to let go of my boy. Um, so, Dan? Steve Brock uh, with Little Miss Door Pitcher. And then when, when, you, when you responded to my question, you went back to Dan and kind of went back to the shade and taller development. I still ask the question again of you, and specifically Dr. Eza, Dr. Henderson, and you, because y'all have been kind of some of the stronger voices uh, opposing the DOC approach and general you know, the uneven approach. My perception from what I hear is that there's been a developed concept of what DFCs are on the ground, heavily centered on single tree selection in that conceptual framework that I think that y'all have in our small group selection. And so my point of question is, is what I believe your perceived concept is and what you saw presented, particularly this morning, and Jeff presented some images of his work, but Buddy did a really nice job, I think, of, of representing a lot of the work they're doing. Does the conception that you have, that I think you have, and I'll, I openly admit that, and what you saw presented this morning, the same thing. And do you think what was presented by Buddy is unsustainable? Okay. In the blue. I'll let you tell answer that question. You know? Yeah, I guess Dr. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciated some of the comments earlier. Uh, I, and I want to identify what I think the forces are very concerned about. When we said we're more concerned, comment was we're managing for structure, we're concerned about structure for wildlife, we're not managing for species, that is a huge red flag for the forestry community. We're very concerned about the species composition in bottomland hardwood forest. And if you ignore that, you know, we're going to have, we're going to have concerns. We're always going to have concerns. Now, if the landowner tells us, I don't care. I just don't care what species is out there, then that's fine. But that landowner needs to know going in, you may be getting rid of this group of species, this suite of species. You may be getting rid of it. it may take your time to get rid of it. If you want to see the long-term effects of selection cutting, either get Norman to give you a tour of some of his areas, or you can certainly go to Catfish Point, folks. When I first saw Catfish Point, there were still some remnant oaks on there. 
We just had a graduate project finish up over there on Park at Catfish Point. You better pack a lunch if you want to get from one oak to the next. Uh, they are scarce over there, and we're not surprised by that. The other thing that I guess I would observe on is that those of us who have long-term data, whether it's the Forest Service or Mississippi State University or Anderson Tully, we all have long-term data, and we come to the same conclusion that we cannot successfully regenerate shade intolerant species and recruit that regeneration. It's like Emil said, we can always get regeneration. We can get fresh Germans out there as long as we've got a seed source. We cannot recruit them into the next stand using uneven age management. And yet the people who don't seem to have a data set that works fine for them. Maybe we've made a mistake by taking data for the last 40 years. That wasn't my question. I mean, the question was, what I saw Buddy say, he had his tree classes up there and the way he was managing everything. I never once, species was not listed up there at all. Stem quality was, the species was not up there at all. So I, that's my answer to your question. There's no consideration for species. Go back to, um, and then this is a blue shirt in the back. I just want to try to clarify. Um, James, James Henderson. Uh, mainly in response to, to Randy's comments earlier. The attempt to try to quantify in terms of dollar value trade off of timber. Please understand, it's not an attempt to attack or discredit DFCs in any way. It's just that we know the landowners have that question. You, you two referenced it earlier. And it wasn't defined. So it's an attempt to try and quantify that based off what information we have available. I was talking to Kenny Rebate yesterday about the possibility of trying to come up with a, a return to wildlife management areas in terms of timber and then compare that to perhaps the returns to traditionally managed timberland to try and quantify that trade-off. And that is not a criticism, but for those people that want to know, can I manage for timber and wildlife and have it all? And again, I apologize for sounding that attempts have been made to make that promise. But we need that information. We really do. Uh, and, and in terms of inaccuracies, possible inaccuracies in my presentation, I presented that at the meeting of Southern Forest Economists, and they were accepting of it. Uh, I used Table 6 of Putnam to represent an even age because I, I have some documentation from the joint venture that that more or less represented the kind of uneven age structure that was desirable in an uneven age system. But please understand, I'm not trying to discredit, and I'm not against DFCs, and I'm not against uneven age management, but for the landowners that are considering these systems, they have to understand the economic trade-off. And as you were mentioning, for some of them, that doesn't matter at all. They want the best wildlife habitat possible because that's their focus, recreational use of land. But it just has to be clear what the trade-off is. That, that's my only issue. Thank you. Back in the back. Okay. Uh, my name is Steve Meadows. I'm with the Forest Service here at Stoneville. And uh, I just want to address Steve's question about sustainability. You know, we saw uh, Buddy's uh, presentation and Jeff's and, and, and Kenny's as well. I don't know whether they're sustainable, okay? Be and the reason is because they did not present information on opening size. What I do know is that if you have a red oak dominated forest stand, okay, red oak dominated stand, and you make an opening of three quarters of an acre or less, you go back 30 years later, and that opening will not be dominated by red oak, okay? That's what the research shows. If we don't know the size of the opening, then we can't comment on whether it's sustainable. It may be, it may not be. But we do know that if it's below this size, all the research has shown that it will not sustain a red oak dominated forest, okay? It's going to change to dominance by another species, most likely some shade, shade tolerant species, because there's not enough sunlight to 
develop that red oak regeneration into the, to the main canopy and that portion of the stand be dominated by red oak. So if it is below that size, and maybe below a larger size, we don't know, but at least we do know that if it's less than three quarters of an acre in size, it will not sustain, it is not sustainable. Now, if you define sustainability as replacing it with trees, then it is sustainable because you're just replacing it with trees. But any forest, any cutting operation, by that definition, is sustainable because you're going to get trees back. But if you want to sustain the same cover type, it, it has to be an opening we know that three quarters of an acre is too small. We don't know what the minimum acceptable size is for, for red oak, but we know that three quarters of an acre is too small. And so if we knew what the opening sizes were in, in their work, in work and Jeff's work and so on, then we could make a comment about sustainability, but we know that three quarters of an acre is, is too small. In the back and back, Dan Day again. Randy, uh, your comment about we're not prescribing any silvicultural system to the landowners. We're just describing the desired future condition. I guess I take some exception with that because the desired future condition of maintaining 30 to 50 percent crown cover or limiting the range of opening sizes is in effect prescribing silvicultural systems and then when uh, leaders in, in, in your group stand up and put a big X through civic cultural systems and narrow it all down to just group selection openings, you are, I don't know if that's in your document or not, but you are advocating civic cultural approaches that are uh, sustainable or are suitable. And, and Dan, you know, I, you know, I'm a speaker too, so you, sometimes you just say things off the cuff, but you said even age management will not give you desired future conditions. And I guess I disagree with that. And I think there's several different approaches you can come at civiculturally and, and achieve and, and still meet your desired future conditions. And part of the, uh, that tool set should be even age management. And there's a lot of ways you can apply that. And, uh, and, and, in, and in fact, I think what is your biggest opening size? Is it seven acres or something like that? Well, to me, that's a clear cut. So we're talking even age management. And if you have a 70 acre property and you cut seven acres every 15 years on a 105 year rotation, you can practice even age management and deliver your desired future conditions. But you cause confusion among landowners when people who represent your perspective stand up and, and say even age management will not deliver this and it's not suitable and I and I know we focus a lot on red oak here and certainly the timber value is there to speak of but it I kind of believe that wildlifers desire mass production in their forests and that you would want to maintain red oak composition on the landscape along with white oak composition it gives your ecosystems tremendous resilience against mass failures when you have severe weather events and whatnot. So there's a lot of ecological reasons to put a lot of emphasis on sustaining our red oak resource. Yeah, let me comment quickly. Uh, Dan's earlier comment about species not mattering, I believe I'm accurate in saying that that is from a perspective of an avian ecologist not working with game species. And in fact, they do, it's just all our perspective is not on the meadow. Yeah. Uh, as a deer biologist, I am very much interested in, in species that are being regenerated. Okay, uh, let's come back here first, and uh, after this, we'll take a break for lunch. I will respond to your comment, Steve. Um, so I would never advocate or, you know, we, we're not advocating that group selection should be more quarters like or smaller. And I don't mean that that doesn't occur sometimes, of course, but uh, I, I'm struggling with 
what I think some, I've had some other people in breaks talk about the fact that there's kind of a contradiction without appropriate application in, in, the, in the argument. Dr. Ezell and other presentations represent that you can do what I would call, even in your presentation, uh, a homogeneous shelter wood treatment that promotes, and it might be with injection, but ultimately it's reducing basal area, allowing a certain amount of light into a stand in order to promote advanced regeneration. Uh, and I'm gonna call it a homogeneous treatment across a specific stand. Uh, and then the other argument is that if you do a three-quarter acre or smaller group selection where you are allowing a certain amount of light into the center of that, that you can't get advanced regeneration. And, and that, and so the, 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 the shelter wood doesn't have any group selection in it, but it, it's being promoted as advancing regeneration, desirable regeneration. And so there seems to be, to me there's a contradiction in that because my argument would be both treatments work. It's dependent on site quality and what's there when you do the treatment. And, and so I'm, I'm and, and what you do after that. I mean, you could have a three quarter acre open because advanced regeneration was there before you did the treatment. And if you treat that small opening in a short, you know, enter the stand sooner and treat it again, it, it might actually develop regeneration over time. I mean, it's about the way it's treated over time, not just the size of a specific opening. And I feel like that's being concentrated on to make a point. And to me, it's about what's there and how it's treated, not specifically just the size. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Can I, can I have a response? Oh, I tell you what, let's, let's end it on that. Uh, we'll come back and lunch. Well, because you can practice yours during a, a lunch. Uh, what I would like to say, barring a, a line from Dr. Chamberlain's talk, if, if we strapped a tracking mo uh, monitor on this mic, it would look more like that dough that you showed. Very, very small, very, very concentrated. Now, what I want to do, though, is I do want to encourage the rest of you. Let's try to make this look a little bit more like the black bear monitor and spread it out across the room. And I don't mean that to stifle uh, the discussion. But I know at times other people in the room maybe don't want to jump in there. But uh, I encourage you, this is your opportunity to inject whatever you want to in inject into this uh, proceeding. So think about that over uh, uh, lunch. You want to write it down during lunch, that, that might be good. So when I call on you, you're ready to go. Thank you, and I guess lunch is right out here in the hall.